Good morning. Uh, my name is Svetlana Avramov-Zamovic and my colleague Joel Esposito with me and Charles Nelson. Uh, we're coming from uh, the United States Naval Academy and today we're going to talk about comparison of the vortex structure as a function of ecological charge for beams carrying orbital angular momentum through underwater optical turbulence. In short, what we're trying to do, we're trying to make a communication system that transmits the messages through complex environment. We record these um, symbols and use machine learning to process the images and process the messages to get a successful decoding. So our work is motivated by the fact that we are interested in creating an alphabet for the communication system that uses machine learning to decode the messages. We use uh, the basis beams. Uh, the basis beams are single topological charge beams that uh, when uh, superimposed create the symbols. What you have on this image is, uh, on this movie is our decoding of 15 letters that we had created uh, using four uh, basis beams and you can clearly see how the optical turbulence is uh, deforming some of these messages, but the machine learning is capable of successfully decoding them. The motivation here is very clear. Can we select basis beams that are resilient to the optical turbulence, considering the fact that we're gonna use machine learning for decoding? And then we are going to suggest that the resulting superposition is also going to be resilient to the machine, uh, to the open, uh, optical turbulence. Just to show you the challenge, this is the 256 um, uh, symbols in an alphabet created by eight basis beams. And cl clearly, some of these uh, details in intensities are intricate, and any distortion in them would confuse one message from the other. So we are very much interested to see which basis is best suited for our creation of alphabet. We selected to uh, work with nine topological charges, uh, Laguerre Gaussian beams, uh, order zero, and we created them by using a spatial light modulator. We created optical turbulence using a single heater in the underwater tank. We propagated about two meters of the uh, propagation uh, length uh, an estimated index of refraction fluctuations are the order of 10 to minus seven. We record these images using the fast uh, speed cameras, and we are going to analyze scintillation index and the vortex wonder as our performance parameters. Experimental details. The most important part here is that we would like to capture each beam in the same turbulence for adequate period of time to gather sufficient data set for a rigorous statistical analysis. The top uh, image clearly shows that as we progress in time, the optical turbulence changes significantly, but since we are using a rapid uh, collection of data, each of the beam is exposed to the same image and they fluctuate accordingly. Our con consideration are that we assume that the optical turbulence varies uh, at the order of 100 milliseconds. That's a big assumption, but we are gonna try to use it. Uh, we are concerned about how fast our SLM can cycle the beams, um, uh, how much is the exposure time on the camera that gives us sufficient light for processing and the storage on the buffer of the camera because we would like to observe the optical turbulence for long period of variations. At the end of the day, we had decided that SLM should cycle 10 milliseconds that the camera should take an image every two milliseconds and that we observe about 100 seconds of the optical turbulence in the water. Effectively, we are taking five images and on our bottom image, we are showing how the vortex diameter for each of the topological charges is increasing as well as how much the variation of these uh, diameter is changing. The, this image shows the mean intensity. 
the, for the beams that we have considered. The matter of the fact is here, we have about 3000 images taken into account for each of these mean intensity um, pictures. And we are also showing how nicely the vortex size matches the topological charge for our analysis. The bottom line of the images is more interesting because those are the scintillation index calculated for each of the pixel in the image. And we can clearly see that as we increase the topological charge, the vortex is also increasing in the scintillation index calculations. And thus, we are seeing less uh, scintillation index in the higher topological charge as an average value. We are uh, getting the expected result from the theoretical predictions where the average simulation index is lower for the higher topological charge, but we're also seeing a little bit of a less values for the um, lower topological charges as well. And those have to deal with the fact how many pixels are engaged and what's going on with the image as a whole. The other uh, plot here, shows the sorted scintillation index for every pixel in our image. We have about 74,000 images of pixels in an image. And we can clearly see, for example, the, race, uh, the trace, uh, the black trace, which is the topological charge nine, how, men, how lower scintillation index values we have for quite a few number of pixels. And actually the distribution is different even for the uh, very low values for the simulation index. Now I would like to introduce Professor James Pizzito to go on with the process. So the second bit of analysis we did uh, focused on the vortex of these beams. So for those of you who have uh, read other works on beam wander, you might notice that um, traditionally, for example, in a case of a Gaussian beam, uh, they might choose to look at the, the centroid of, of the intensity and track how that moves around. And that probably makes a lot of sense for a Gaussian beam, but in the case of the beams that we work with, um, what, what happens is that, uh, that that centroid can be quite a bit thrown off by that scintillation, by as you look around the, the annulus of, of this ring-like structure, you can see there's a lot of variations in brightness around there. And that contributes to pulling um, the, the intensity centroid, which is the magenta crosshair, there um, wildly about the image. But on the other hand, the vortex itself is, is much more stable. The blue crosshair is the center of the vortex. So we've decided that this is an interesting feature to track both because we think it's a stable and distinctive feature for machine learning, but also because from a, a physics perspective, the vortex seems to be quite robust in the face of optical turbulence. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our automated processing pipeline with over 51,000 images in the data set. Um, we certainly can't track that vortex manually. So we, we, what happens is we get a raw image uh, because it's such a low exposure time from the high speed photography. Uh, we have to enhance the contrast of it a bit. We threshold it. And then we have to take a few steps to repair small defects. So for example, there's a small fissure here that prevents this from meeting our criteria of a vortex, which is uh, a contiguous region of black pixels completely surrounded by bright pixels. So we repair that fissure or uh, we clean up little um, peninsulas along the edge. We might remove small uh, speckles and what we're left with is this approximately oval shaped region of the vortex in the center of the image. From that, we can use its second moments to compute a best fit ellipse. And that's what this blue circle is. And we found that this method is surprisingly robust in the face of optical turbulence and um, you know, that background artifacts. Uh, you can see the steps in the processing pipeline here. So that's what we've used to calculate most of the data in this section. Um, and our conclusions are that in general, uh, beams with higher topological charges have vortices that seem to be more stable in the face of optical turbulence. That shows up in a few different ways. Uh, this shows the beam wander of the different beams. As we move from um, charge two all the way up to charge nine, we see that those beams tend to move around less. On average, the charge nine might move about five pixels, 
whereas these lower order charges move on the order of seven or eight pixels. Uh, the beams, the vortices also tend to stay more circular when the beams have a higher topological charge. So again, beam nine is closer to a perfect circle, which would be a zero on this scale, whereas the lower order beams tend to be higher in terms of their eccentricity or elongation. Uh, finally, they have more constant sizes. So obviously the higher order beams have a larger vortex, but what we're looking at here is how does that size of that vortex change uh, in the turbulence? And we see that beam seven, eight, and nine have these really high and tight distributions while the lower order charges vary as much as plus or minus 40% in terms of the size of the vortex. So in terms of our accomplishments, we, we have this really rich data set and we're going to continue to explore it, mine it over the coming months. Uh, we believe we succeeded in creating an environment where the different beams were subject to similar turbulence levels. And we're quite proud of this novel method to track the vortex. There's still some issues to be resolved in future versions of the experiment. And a lot of those have to do with synchronizing the SLM and the camera um, as this high-speed data capture unfolds. Uh, in conclusion, though, we've, we've, we see that beams with higher topological charges have less scintillation, uh, less vortex wander, and the shape and size of the vortex distorts less. We believe that this implies that those beams are better candidates uh, for basis beams in our communication system because they're less likely to be influenced by top optical turbulence and therefore more easily recognized by the machine learning. I'll leave you with this visualization of, of the different beams over time and how their vortices evolve. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate that.